Good afternoon, everybody. This, this is, uh, we're into, um, I guess, the top of the ninth. And whether we are one run ahead or one run behind depends on your frame of mind, whether you're you know, the half, glass half full or half empty type of person. Um, but I think uh, we're already agreed amongst the speakers that we have saved the best for last. Um, my name is Hubert Murray. I manage the Sustainable Initiatives Program at Partners Healthcare, which is also a sponsor of um, this effort, and I'm on the steering committee. And for me, this has been three days' work because Partners is about to embark on a resiliency program for all our facilities, most of which are on, uh, on the coast. Um, and I'm sure that many of you are in a similar position with you know, centrally work-related um, subject matter, which is being very well informed by this conference, or at least I hope it is. So this, um, this last uh, session is called a call to action. And it's basically uh, a discussion on what we can do to move forward in our efforts to adapt and mitigate impacts on climate change, which we sort of talked about in the last session. Um, so we're going to hear from uh, three people, uh, Jim Newman, Margaret Davidson, and Tom Wilbanks. And just to start with um, Jim Newman, if I, by the way, you've all seen the biographies in the back of the uh, document you have. Um, but just to uh, synopsis is Mr. Newman specializes in the economics of climate change and air pollution regulation. Um, specializes in the economics of climate change adaptation and within that area, analysis of the impacts of sea level rise. And uh, I remember a figure from a 2009 report by the Allianz uh, Insurance Company, which suggested that $468 billion worth of economic activity was at risk in the year 2050 in the city of Boston alone. Um, Jim Newman was a lead author for the IPCC Working Group Chapter Two, Working Group Two Chapter on the Economics of Adaptation, and a lead author for the Coastal Chapter of the soon-to-be-released National Climate Assessment. Mr. Oh, oh, it's been released. So this is out of date already. Okay, so welcome, and thank you. Thanks very much, Hubert. So. Uh, I know you guys heard a little bit about economics yesterday. I'm sorry I wasn't here to join you for that. Uh, but, but I'm going to present, I think, a slightly different perspective on economics. Uh, first, at a very high level, what the IPCC uh, might have to say that's relevant for, especially even thinking about local uh, considerations, even though the IPCC, of course, is taking a global perspective. And talk a little bit about uh, what I learned from Margaret Davidson and others, uh, and contributed a little bit, Margaret, on, uh, uh, for the National Climate Assessment and what's being said there. Uh, some really important key messages, I think, that involve economic thinking. And then I want to show you some of my own research that I think also is relevant in thinking about this largely rhetorical question, right, Tom? Uh, do the economic costs of doing nothing motivate adaptation action in coastal cities? So. Uh, that last topic in particular, uh, some new modeling and data, I think we answered some other questions here. Uh, as Hubert said, we want to understand how much economic value is at stake uh, in the coastal zone and, and potentially threatened by climate change. And uh, <clears throat> also a question, uh, can I rely on plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as we heard in the last session, or do I need to start adapting? And I think maybe by this point, folks maybe know the answer to that question, but I'm going to provide some data to back it up. So, I want to explain a little bit about how we thought about the economics of adaptation and taking adaptation action uh, in my IPCC experience. So this is a very sort of non-technical way of thinking about what we might like to do in adaptation space and what we end up doing. So you can see these concentric circles <clears throat> begin with the outside circle here. The total adaptation space is what somebody might think uh, we ought to do a, a long laundry list of things that might make sense to do in adapting in the coast. There are then considerations like technical and physical limits about what we're able to do. There are resource limitations that involve economic thinking. 
there are objectives uh, that further narrow the range of things we might ultimately do. We may not think this is the most important thing we ought to do uh, with our money. Uh, and ultimately, we have what we will do, which also incorporates consideration of things like implementation constraints. Uh, so for example, we might want to do it. It might fit our objectives. We don't have the budget this year. So when are we going to do these sorts of things? And this is the only economics training I will provide for you or request from you. This is, this is the only graph I'll show you, but I couldn't get away. I couldn't be a card-carrying economist without showing you at least one of these graphics. This is actually the more technical version of the, doc, of the diagram I just showed you. So this one here, let me see. This, I'll try not to get too, too crazy here, but start on the left side here. What we have is the cost of climate change here, which means if we don't do anything, what's going to happen? What kind of cost can we expect to incur? And over here, we have adaptation costs, which is actions we might take and exchange money for in order to try to reduce this cost of climate change. So when I graph the intersection of those two things, how much we spend on adaptation versus how much we can reduce the, the full cost of climate change, which is way up here, we see a graph that looks kind of like this, OK? So we always see these curves in economics, right? So what does this mean? Well, right now, I would argue, for coastal adaptation, we are basically in this part of the curve, a very steep part of the curve, which means we can pay a little bit in adaptation cost and get a lot of reduction in the cost of climate change. And by the way, I shouldn't ignore this. This is free adaptation. Okay, there's actually some things that are free. Okay, there is a free lunch, right? Uh, um, most economists won't tell you that, but there are a few things that are free, but not very much. What we, but the good news is that we're in this space here. But the bad news is we're never going to be able to fully adapt we're, unless we're willing to spend an awful lot of money. And even then, we're going to hit technical uh, limitations. So that's, that's the main point I want to make from this particular slide. Um, and there's more to see. If, you, if you're really interested, the uh, assignment for later is to actually try to figure out what's in this graphic. So I don't know if this graph, if this, uh, this has been shown before, this picture. I think a bunch of folks in this audience have probably seen it before. But there's a house actually in Gilchrist, Texas, um, that illustrates the potential of this very steep curve. That is the potential for very high adaptive capacity for certain types of structures, at least in the coastal zone. So this is the house before Hurricane Ike. This is the house after Hurricane Ike. Um, this was a very successful example of someone investing in adaptive capacity, basically raising their house up so that when the storm surge came in, and I think the storm surge for Ike was something like 20 feet at its peak, this is right on the coast. Um, so this is a sacrificial, uh, you probably heard about this yesterday, this is a sacrificial floor, so the storm surge went rocketing through here, the house stayed. This is a windproof, hurricane-proof roof, so it didn't blow off. Um, and this guy did a great, great job of hurricane proofing, but none of his neighbors did. <laughs> So this, is a, this photo, actually, I put this photo on, and people say, that looks Photoshopped. And it really does. Um, but So I had to show this one as well to show it's really not Photoshopped. And if you look this up, you'll see it, it's all over the web. This is a really successful example. But what happened in all these other places? Well, basically, there wasn't the word out. There wasn't the, um, the awareness of high adaptive capacity. <clears throat> but there's one other thing I want to show you about this particular situation, and that's what's going on today. So this is the house today. Actually, if you go to Google Earth, thanks to the miracle of Google Earth, you can actually see the front view of this house. It's in Gilchrist. It's right near the channel here that goes into um, what's called Rollover Bay, which is kind of an interesting name. Um, this is the house location right here. What I think is very interesting is that we have to make some choices here about where we're going to adapt and where we're not going to adapt, where we're going to move back. And that's going on in the wake of this uh, very uh, catastrophic event. So this gentleman managed to maintain his property. This here, this property next door, uh, there was a house there before. These are now all trailers. Okay, So they've made an adaptation here to say, we're not going to let this happen again. We're not going to rebuild. We're not even going to build as expensively as our friend next door here. We're going to basically be mobile. We're responding to this risk in a positive way. And many of these other houses just won't rebuild. They are, they are acknowledging that there's a risk there that isn't worth taking anymore. And to me, that is informed by very apparent economics to these individuals, which is this is, a, this is an economic and financial reality for them, and they're responding in a way that makes sense. So a lot of what I want to push today is how do you get across that economic and financial reality to individuals, to governments, uh, and to any other actors who can make a difference in adapting better. 
A few other thoughts on IPCC here. Um, the uh, special report on extreme events is maybe came up earlier, but if, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's worth getting somewhat familiar with. Um, it, does, uh, it, it helps to inform exactly how these extreme events actually relate to climate change and to other socioeconomic factors that are increasing risk. And I put up this graphic, which is, I think, a wonderful uh, schematic representation that I can't go all the way through, but let me just point out here. This disaster risk is a function of three different elements here. There's uh, weather and climate events, to be sure, and we worry about those getting worse. Then there's vulnerability, and then there's exposure, and too many people forget those elements. These are controllable facts of adaptation, controllable elements that we can adapt to. And so when you see a graphic like this, which is also in the special report on extreme events, and the insurance industry, among others, tells you, hey, things are getting much worse. We have overall losses here. Uh, uh, this is a time trend here from 1980 to 2010. This is data from Munich Re. It's actually a couple years old now. And what we see, the total height of the bar is the damages in the US. So this is, uh, this is Katrina. This is Ike. Uh, these are big hurricanes, mostly, that are driving these sorts of things. The, the key driver behind this according to the analysis that has been done, is the increase in exposure. Sure, there's an increase in extreme events, but we have more in the way. So this is a very important, and more valuable things in the way as well. And this is an important element, I think, to, to, to understand how the economics of adaptation informs this. So uh, in a minute, you'll see this person here. Uh, this is our, uh, our lead-in for the, um, the National Climate Assessment. Uh, these are approved uh, charts, although I'm not subject to the same constraints you are, Margaret. Because uh, um, uh, I'm just a, I'm just a lowly consultant, but this was a great group of individuals. This is one of your steering committee members up here. Um, a great group of individuals got together to try to say, okay, what's new in thinking about uh, risks in the climate uh, in the coastal zone? And my contribution was to try to say something about what's new uh, when you think it from an economics perspective. Um, I think you've probably seen graphics like this that are probably even better about projected sea level rise and flooding by 2050, but I think one of the important things that this illustrates is that we're moving beyond just thinking about sea level rise and inundation and actually thinking analytically and economically in all sorts of different ways, in spatial terms, in, <clears throat> in terms of building risk and all, uh, combining these two risks, and it's really important to do that well. So uh, one of the key messages on economic disruption is, is listed here. What we basically are saying here is that there's an awful lot of really valuable stuff that is subject to coastal risks and that will be exacerbated by climate change. And it's not just people who live in coastal regions that ought to care about this. This graphic is a great one that I think was provided by Margaret's office, in fact. Um, that shows that the coastal to inland connections are very strong and that disruption in the coastal zone affects a broad range of people, not just people on the coast. So this graphic, in simple terms, looks at ports. This is Los Angeles, Houston, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Seattle. And it shows the interconnections, which interestingly span, this, this line goes all the way across to New York. Uh, basically, it shows the interconnections that trade and movement of goods, actually, uh, why that makes uh, an interest in the coastal zone of interest to everybody who buys something. So uh, very, very interesting graphic to sit and study for a while uh, if you have a chance. So there's another piece of the economics uh, contribution, I think, in the NCA that I think is often overlooked but was actually a part of this symposium. I think yesterday you heard quite a bit about some disadvantaged communities that are very much interested and challenged by uh, climate change and particularly by adaptation to climate change. And those are important to consider. The, the efficiency piece is what I spend most of my time thinking about, for those of you who understand economics, but the equity piece is also now getting into the, uh, the literature and becoming an important part of decision making. So uh, this is a graphic that's actually in the National Climate Assessment that, that shows uh, um, a social vulnerability index and how it maps across the coast. So the, these pinkish areas are, are areas of high social vulnerability. This is a relative index, by the way, and I can tell you more about it if you're interested. This is a, the green areas are low social vulnerability. So we can zoom in a little if we go to the underlying research and get a better sense of what's going on here in Massachusetts. Well, actually, as it turns out, there's a lot of green here and a lot of white, but there are pockets of, of uh, of purple, of high social vulnerability all around, and some of them are actually too small to see here. 
And surprisingly, there's an awful lot on the West Coast as well, in places you might not think that, that uh, you'd expect to see it. But the point is that what you might think about the coast is that it's a, it's a playground for rich folks or it's an area where only the rich can actually afford to be players. And in fact, it's not. There's a balance there. There actually is quite a bit of social vulnerability in the coastal zone. So, and, and the key point that I think comes if you dig down into the underlying literature, not an approved graphic, by the way, but from the underlying literature that's cited, if you move from, it, this, is a, this is a graph that relates area to social vulnerability, along that same index here, okay? And you can see there's more area in these high social vulnerability classes that's at risk from sea level rise. This is particularly about sea level rise. But more important, there are huge challenges in adapting. In these areas, there's enough money, there's enough value to justify a sort of armoring or nourish response. In other words, adaptation can be financed in those areas. In these areas where there's high social vulnerability, there's not enough there there to actually justify a collective effort to protect, at least not economically. And that's a real challenge. That means most of these folks run a very high risk of being displaced because they're not able to adapt. They don't have the resources to adequately adapt. Okay, let me move on then in the last five or 10 minutes here that I have to, the, um, to some of the new research that's coming out that my firm's involved in and others are involved in. Kirk Bosma, who was here earlier, is actually involved in some of this research, helping us with the mapping. Paul kirshen has been involved for years. He's, he was here earlier, I think, as well. Um, as has Carrie Emanuel been involved, who's here at MIT and is a, uh, well, there's Paul, way up there. Hi, Paul. So uh, this, this, uh, this map will soon be in an EPA document that summarizes some of the issues associated with climate change and how mitigation might reduce that. And uh, I have to give acknowledgement to their funding. What we have here is Tampa Bay. And what we're showing is a highly simplified version of some of our results, which is the area at risk of inundation, which is the darker red. So these are areas where elevation alone puts these areas at risk of inundation from sea level rise. But then there's a much broader area here that is at risk of significant storm surge damages. And afterward, I can tell you what we mean by significant storm surge damage. It's a complicated definition. But basically, you can see a whole big, a, a new big area opens up as of great concern when you combine sea level rise and storm surge in an integrated analysis and think about what's vulnerable and what's potentially at risk. So this is an important perspective that we're trying to take. Um, just to sort of break that apart into individual pieces, here's this, a similar set of maps on vulnerability, although this actually incorporates adaptation response, but bear with me here. The point is, if we think about the risks of sea level rise only, and for example, we took the IPCC estimates of sea level rise, which don't incorporate some elements of dynamic uh, ice sheet melting, for example, this is the area that we might worry about in Tampa Bay. If we then add sea level rise with dynamic ice sheet melting concerns, and we take some of the higher end considerations of how much ice sheets might melt in the future, then we start to worry about a bigger area, and it gets about this big. If we take the IPCC estimates and combine them with estimates of storm surge, all of a sudden we're worried about a much, much bigger area at risk. And uh, in fact, this whole red area here is an area where it might be economic to abandon, that there is actually not enough economic activity in those areas to justify and finance the construction of uh, protection measures, which is stunning. Um, and then when we, when we put all these elements together, sea level rise, storm surge, dynamic ice sheet melting, we get down in the bottom right corner. So that's an illustration of why we need to think of these things in an integrated fashion. Here's another illustration. This is a, a measure of the costs of efficient adaptations to sea level rise and storm surge. So if we were to use a benefit cost framework and say, okay, what, what would we do in response to, to sea level rise and how would that change as we move to storm surge? We looked at 17 areas across the country that are indicated here. And then these are the cities here. So you can look, we don't have Boston, sorry, but we do have Barnstable County here. Um, you can see that in some areas, the incremental effect of storm surge is quite modest. This, this dark red bar is what it would take to respond to just the sea level rise uh, question here in, uh, in the Barnstable County area. When you add storm surge, it goes up a little bit more. That's partly because if you protect for sea level rise, you also do a lot to protect for storm surge. So that's good news for Barnstable. But we just looked at Tampa, right? So here's Tampa. If they only protect for storm surge, they're looking at, and I've forgotten the units here, I think we're looking at about uh, just under $20 billion uh, to try to do their protection here. If instead they're worried about storm surge, and they ought to be, look how much higher this bar is. Now we're up here 
into the, into the 70 billion. So there's a significant additional piece that needs to be considered. And because this is long-lived infrastructure, you want to think about this now. You don't want to wait until this is upon us because it may be too late to actually make these sorts of investments. Particularly if you only protect for sea level rise and then you have to add on later on, you may not have built the infrastructure in a way that's flexible. Okay, now I did say I was going to address the question of whether you could rely on mitigation and the answer is no. Here's a similar set of graphics. Now what I'm doing is I'm looking again across the 17 areas. The dark bars are the uh, light bars from the previous chart. So in other words, what are you in for in terms of adaptation costs if you adapt to sea level rise and storm surge? And the bar next to it is how much that cost gets decreased if we pursue an aggressive mitigation program in the United States. Not very much. <laughs> and this is another way to illustrate it graphically. So these are the cumulative benefits of mitigation policy in the US. So this is work that we're now informing uh, EPA on and as they consider these rules to take mitigation action. How does that work in, in the coastal zone? Uh, so what we see uh, in this, let's just look at these two dotted graphs. The, um, the benefits of a very aggressive policy actually accumulate quite a bit in the latter half of the century. This is, this, notice these lines are nowhere until 2050. So that means there are basically, for sea level rise, zero benefits of mitigating through 2050. Why? Because it takes an awful long time to turn around sea level rise. It's a really big battleship that will take a really big, long time to turn around. There's a lot of inertia in the system. But after that point, it gets much bigger. Now, of course, if you did nothing until 2050 and then tried to act, all these graphs get pushed out even farther. It takes even more effort to, to adapt. So this is another graphic that I like to show, which relates mitigation with adaptation. Is that the five minute mark? Oh, sorry. <laughs> OK, just a couple of minutes more. Um, these are the cumulative benefits of in, in, mitigation if I consider people adapting or not adapting. So it's a little hard to think about people not adapting in the coastal zone because there's a lot of things we'll probably do on our own. But some of that stuff has to happen with action now. So the same graphics we see here where the benefits, this is the same, this is the top line from the previous graph. We've got a whole different scale here. This is now $3 trillion at the top here, uh, cumulative benefits. So uh, basically this red line shows us what are the benefits of a mitigation program if people adapt? Relatively modest number. And this line says, what if people don't adapt? Well, all of a sudden, mitigation becomes much more important because there's a lot more at stake that they didn't protect. So the two have to be done together. And my main point is that taking adaptation now is absolutely justified by the economics. And this is my last slide. Um, same sort of information and data, but now uh, I'm now starting to discount for those economists who are in the room here using a 3% discount rate, and these are billion dollars, so when we get them to uh, numbers like this, we're talking trillions, just to orient you. If we assume that people are gonna do effective adaptation, a climate change scenario where we don't do anything about mitigation uh, suggests that we could have $690 billion in discounted damages across the US. If we take an aggressive mitigation policy, we can reduce that sum and get some benefits. Okay, and the, and the difference is about 3%. So not a lot that we can reduce. But if we don't take any adaptation action, the damages balloon to $4.2 billion. So that's, sorry, $4.2 trillion. So this is a huge amount of economic activity. And this is just the asset value. This, all, this doesn't incorporate all the economic disruption, all the indirect effects, the regional economic effects. None of those are in here. This is just the direct asset value that's affected. So my point is, I'm trying to tell you that the economics suggest a few take-home messages. First of all, don't assume that you can adapt to all climate change. That's the message from the IPCC, okay? There will be what we call residual risks. There will be some risk you can't adapt to. I was encouraged to hear Hubert say earlier that when they built Spalding, they put all sorts of uh, top-notch te top uh, technological responses to the, in, that, in that rehabilitation hospital. Um, to try to respond to sea level rise and storm surge risk, but they also acknowledge it's gonna get wet. They can't adapt to it all. Second, the US is highly vulnerable in economic terms to coastal threats and social vulnerability is higher than you might expect. See the National Climate Assessment for more information on that one. The third piece, mitigating greenhouse gases will help reduce the threat, but it's gonna take a long time to have a significant impact and that's the EPA work that I presented. 
And then finally, my main point, I think, for particularly for folks who are here from local government, is that adaptation in the coastal zone in general is a very cost-effective option. We're in the steep part of that curve that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. And particularly, this is true in densely populated areas. The sooner you start, the better off you'll be. So I think no economist that I know of who's sensible, as Tom distinguished two groups of economists here, right? There's regular economists and there's sensible economists. I, I like to think I'm in the second group, but the sensible economists are not trying to tell you that you should use benefit cost analysis as a whip or as a tool where, that is the only one to employ in making decisions about adaptation. However, economists can tell you a lot about what people will do if you don't set up policies and incentives to try to get them to act right. And those, that sort of incentive analysis, I think something all of us need to be educated here to better understand what's gonna happen in the coastal zone. So I'm, I'm done, and uh, I guess I turn it over to Hubert now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.